Ladies and gentlemen, hello again, and welcome to another Reflected Reality Simulations video. My name is Graham. This is an extra video in the Hot Start TPM 900 series. Extra videos are just a few moments away from the simulator to look at some details from the flying videos in some greater depth. This follows on from part 5, where we did a flight from Dundee Airport on the east coast of Scotland across to Glenforsa on the island of Mull, just off the west coast. Now during that flight we considered how much fuel would be required if we couldn't land at Glenforsa and had to divert back to Glasgow Airport. So today we're going to take a look at fuel planning. And fuel planning doesn't have to be complicated. On a light aircraft like the Cessna 172, you could simply say that you will always fill the tanks and you won't fly the aircraft for too long. And that's a perfectly reasonable strategy. It will just limit what you can do with the aircraft. Because the Cessna 172, you can fill the tanks with maybe three people on board, if you want to take four people and some bags, or maybe even two people, but out of a smaller airfield, you may not be able to fill the tanks altogether. So there's always a payload fuel trade-off that you've got to make. Fuel planning is about considering how much fuel you need to fly from A to B. That's common sense. Fuel to fly from the departure airfield to the destination airfield. But we want to have an extra plan in mind. We want to be able to divert to our alternate airfield just in case the destination airfield is closed temporarily or there's maybe weather considerations there or, or some other factor that means you can't go on and land at your destination. Always a good idea to have an alternate airfield even for local VFR flights. Of course what you don't want to do is to fly all the way to your destination, divert your alternate and then have the engine shut down as soon as you touch down. That would be a very bad thing. So we want to make sure we've got some fuel left in the tanks. Normally, we'd uh, ensure we've got a final reserve of 30 to 45 minutes on the aircraft. So we want to plan to be on the ground somewhere with a minimum of 30 minutes flight time remaining. Also, you don't just put the fuel in the aircraft and then take off straight away. You've got to taxi from either the fuel pumps or from the parking stand out towards the departure runway. So at the moment, we've got taxi fuel. We've got trip fuel or flight fuel, diversion fuel, and final reserves. Flying in a straight line from the departure of the destination is ideal, but all too often there's uh, some other factor in the way. There could be weather that requires a diversion, uh, in which case we're going to burn a little bit more fuel. So we'll add another fuel uh, load on there for contingencies. And this is fuel planning in a nutshell. Getting from the parking stand to the destination with a little bit of contingency in hand, the option to go to the alternate and landing at the alternate with sufficient fuel remaining for about half an hour's flying. So how do we get those fuel figures? Well, with the TBM 900, we can look in the pilot's operating handbook. All the figures are in here. We could do this for every flight. So we say that, for example, we're going to use the long range uh, cruise figures today. It's ISA conditions. We're going to cruise at uh, flight level 250. True airspeed, uh, or indicated airspeed, sorry, is 151 knots, and it's burning 39 gallons per hour. We can work it out from there, and this descent distance planning as well. But that's going to get very tedious if you have to do uh, 20 minutes worth of fuel planning for every flight. Fortunately, because the TBM performs very close to real world figures, there's applications available. So, for example, this is TBM performance on the uh, iPhone. Or you could use SimBrief. It's got a profile for the TBM 900. Both of these give you a fairly accurate fuel plan. And because the Hot Start TBM 900 performs very close to the real world figures, uh, the, the app here gives you very good results. And SimBrief seems to give you reasonable figures as well. What if you're flying an aircraft that maybe doesn't have any documentation available? Or perhaps you've got one of those products where the developer hasn't put as much love into it as uh, Hot Start have done, and it doesn't really meet the manufacturer's fuel planning. I've seen many flight simulator aircraft that are far too thirsty. How do you go about planning fuel for those aircraft? Well, it's a fairly straightforward academic exercise. These are figures for the TBM 900, just out of my own interest and, and partly for this video. But it's simply a case of loading the aircraft up to maximum takeoff weight getting airborne and then flying your climb profile, recording the uh, distance that you've flown to a distant waypoint, how long it's taken and how much fuel you've burned. 
So from sea level up to 30,000 feet, I recorded the figures every 5,000 feet and then flew around for a little bit to where below max landing weight and then recorded the descent figures. On a second flight, I went up to each of the cruise altitudes and measured the true airspeed and the fuel flow. I used two separate profiles, economy cruise and maximum cruise that are just the, the figures I like to work with. And then it's a little bit of a spreadsheet exercise. So let's say I want to fly 150 nautical miles. I look at how much climb and descent distance would be. I factor that, work out how much uh, cruise time we have, and then it all comes together and you get the fuel burn for the sector. It's a fairly interesting exercise to carry out and very simple to do on a spreadsheet as well. The real benefit is you're getting the fuel figures directly from the simulator. So if you've got an aircraft that doesn't uh, match the real world figures or maybe the real world figures are, are not available, you can still create a very realistic fuel plan for the aircraft. If that sounds too complicated, you can do it the easy way as well. One of my favorite aircrafts in X-Plane 10 was the Freeware DC-9. There was no fuel information available with that aircraft. So I simply measured it. I took off and fly a, flew a continuous climb up to an approximate cruising altitude, recorded how much fuel was used in the first hour. So that includes the taxi out, the takeoff and the climb, and then how much fuel was used for each further hour. I measured the reserve fuel, and then the result is a perfectly viable, workable fuel plan. It doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. But what you see on the screen here, the trip fuel, the contingency diversion, this is what we want to try and achieve with the TBM 900, so we can work out how much fuel we need to load. Let's start with the reserves. So I measured the TBM's fuel performance at 1,500 feet above sea level. And I measured that at uh, 45 minutes, it would burn 36 US gallons. Now, if you were a commercial operator and you had the digital uh, performance information available, you would use 1,500 feet above the aerodrome. So landing in somewhere like Denver, your reserve could be a little bit lower. And airlines do that because they want to minimize every kilogram of fuel carried. We don't need to optimize it to that extent. So sea level plus 1500 is, is fine for this. On those reserve figures, we also want to have the diversion fuel in mind. I used a simple plan of 150 nautical miles, climbing up to flight level 150 and then back down again, and calculated that would take 44 US gallons. The result is that at our destination airfield, we would need to land with 80 US gallons in the tanks. And that's fairly consistent. I, I tend to use those figures roughly for planning with the TBM. Now, what's important to realize is 80 US gallons is a fair amount of fuel. It works out to be 302 liters. Now, 302 liters of water would be 302 kilograms. But as fuel is slightly less dense, uh, it's a lot lighter. It's 242 kilograms. Incidentally, that's why when you drain the fuel from the fuel drainer, uh, on a light aircraft, it's water that you're trying to look for because water's at the bottom of the tank and fuel's at the top of the tank. But consider what 242 kilograms or 533 pounds is. That's about three people. You're landing with the equivalent weight of three people every time you land at your destination. Now, if you're trying to sell this aircraft, if you're trying to market this aircraft where other aircraft are available, you can see that it might be beneficial to try and massage these figures ever so slightly. So rather than stating your figures with a 150 nautical mile alternate, you may choose to use a 50 nautical mile alternate. And rather than publishing figures with 45 minutes, you may choose to publish figures with 20 minutes of reserves. And that means that your required landing fuel figure is a lot lower. That means there's more payload available because you require less fuel. Also, 80 gallons is about a third of the fuel tanks on the TBM. If we can nudge that figure down just a little bit, we can state a longer range for the aircraft than may be practical in real life. The car manufacturers used to do this as well. Cars used to be uh, measured, their economy used to be measured at speeds that were most suitable for that vehicle type. So a larger car would be measured with highway miles and a smaller car would be measured with city miles. These days, though, we have to use a common measuring system, a common methodology to work out what the miles per gallon is on a car. These are the uh, US EPA figures. 
and there's a method of assessing how the miles per gallon are calculated. It's the same with aircraft. The National Business Aviation Association publish a set of procedures for establishing the aircraft's range. They call it the NBAA IFR range. I'm not going to read it to you, but it's a process for working out how you calculate the diversion and the reserve fuel. That way, business aircraft are compared like with like. You can't massage your figures when you state the NBAA range. It's also a fairly useful system. Uh, if you've got nothing else to work with, this um, strategy here should leave you with plenty of diversion and reserve fuel available. It's always worth keeping that in mind when you read about an aircraft from the 1960s or 70s where it's got a stated range and in practice that's actually a, an unachievable range for the aircraft. So moving on from the required landing fuel. Trip fuel. In this case, let's say 96 US gallons would allow us to fly for 500 nautical miles at flight level 300. As well as that trip fuel, I want to consider my contingency for that weather en route. 5% of the trip fuel, or a minimum of 5 minutes, that's fairly uh, universal across the board. So we'll call that 5 US gallons. Adding that 96 and that 5 together with the 80 landing fuel means that we need to take off with 181 US gallons. To get to take off with 181 US gallons, we'll include some taxi fuel. 9 gallons for 15 minutes is reasonable for the TBM, which means that the fuel required is 190 US gallons. 190 gallons in the tanks to fly for 500 miles and have satisfactory reserves remaining. That seems fairly straightforward. But what about the winds? So my 96 US gallons was for 500 nautical miles. But you know the aircraft fly in the air, they don't drive along like road vehicles. So maybe the miles per gallon is a little bit different if we've got headwinds. Well fortunately, it's not too difficult to calculate that. These are the figures that I used. Here's my 500 mile range, looking at climbing up to flight level 300. I'm going to spend 304 miles on the cruise, 196 climbing and descending at the economy cruise, which gives me 96 US gallons. What I need to do is decide how I'm going to calculate those headwinds. There's a very simple mathematical way of doing it. We simply calculate a distance called air miles. So we'll consider this 500 nautical miles to be ground miles. Then we'll take the ground miles, divide it by the ground speed, multiply it by the true air speed, and that's the number of air miles. Now this is going to seem counterintuitive. We're calculating a distance called air miles that don't actually exist. But if you've got nothing more than a chart that shows you fuel burn over distance, then maybe this is the only way to do it. So in this example here, we've got 500 nautical miles. If I was to assume 80 knots of headwind, so 280 knots true airspeed, 80 knot headwind would mean that my ground speed would be 200 knots. That works about out to be two and a half or two and a half hours. Then I multiply it by the 280 knots and says, and it says 700 nautical air miles. So I'm not flying 700 miles, I'm flying 500 miles, but in my table, in my calculator, rather than 500 here, I would have to use 700. And that will give me the appropriate fuel calculation. Of course, you may also say that, well, Graham, you've got two and a half hours here, and I've got fuel burn per hour here. Why not just work it out from there? And you'd be exactly correct. That's a, another way of doing it. You'll also be considering that this is really based on the cruise speed. It doesn't really care much about the climb and descent. And that is true. What's important to realize is the headwind doesn't matter for the time to climb the aircraft. You will always get to your cruising altitude, in this case, flight level 300. It'll always take you 28 minutes to get there. And it will always take you 29 US gallons. With nil wind, you'll cover 102 miles. If you've got a strong headwind, you'll cover less but it will still take you the same time and the same fuel burn. So the stronger the headwinds, the higher the percentage of the flight time is done at the cruise. And therefore, these figures become less important. It's a bit of a fudge, but it works for the vast majority of cases. And we don't want to make this too complicated. It gets into the realm of computerized flight planning. 
And what we're trying to do is trying to understand the process for uh, planning fuel here. If you want super accurate figures, use the profiles available on SimBrief. We can actually make it even easier for flight simulation. I've seen some videos where simulator pilots have gone into great depth on their flight planning. They spent seemingly hours on planning the correct flight, planning the correct route, the aircraft configuration, and then they've got airborne and retracted the flaps at 150 feet and the whole thing's just falling apart. I tend to focus on the flight procedures on flying the aircraft because that's what I enjoy. I want my fuel planning to be as simple as possible. So let's see if we can make it any easier with the TBM. This is the plan that we had before. We've got the taxi fuel, the diversion fuel and the reserve fuel. And it's about 89 gallons here. So why don't we just call it basic fuel, 100 US gallons. 100 gallons gives us fuel for taxi, diversion of around about 150 miles and reserves. Seems like a nice round number to keep in mind. So 100 gallons, basic fuel. Then we need to put in fuel for the flight as well. And remember previously, we looked at um, the EPA mileage for cars. Cars are measured in miles per gallon. We could do the same with the TBM and it's fairly straightforward. Flights above 5,000 feet, working at doing three nautical miles per gallon. Above 15,000 feet, four nautical miles per gallon. And above 25,000 feet, five nautical miles per gallon. It's really straightforward. My economy profile is simply 60 gallons per hour, or if that's going to exceed 750 ITT, 750 ITT. Straightforward. These are still air miles though. We would have to factor those for the wind. So if I want to fly 500 miles, I would have to do my conversion. But I hope you can see here that on my 500 mile example, that would mean 100 US gallons. Plus the 100 basic, it would take me to 200 US gallons fuel on board. My more complicated method only showed 196 gallons. That's a tiny difference. This makes it a lot easier to work out. Rather than doing that air miles calculation as well, we could simply say, well, let's just add on 10% for the headwind. At low level, 10% for 20 knots. Mid level, 10% for 25 knots headwind. And at high level, 10% for 30 miles headwind. That's based on these approximate cruise speeds. Fuel planning for the TBM 900 doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. I hope that makes sense. If you do have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below. Thanks very much for listening.